call this meeting to order, whatever that means. I wanted to start off by just saying that uh, the Colorado House passed the RTV bill uh, yesterday by a 38 to 24 vote. Right. And, uh, and it will give RTV greater flexibility. I think it's going on to the Senate, probably Transportation Committee, and uh, happens to be chaired by a senator named, oh, what's her name? Oh, Faith Winter. <laughs> who's, uh, I think, a great supporter of our efforts. So uh, looks pretty good. Also, our co-sponsor is the, is the Democratic Senate whip, who I know fairly well. Anyway, shall we, shall we move on with the agenda? Uh, first off, the uh, Finance Committee meeting from March 17th. Uh, if you have carefully read your agenda, like I know all of you do, you will have noticed that the words transfer per trip on the second page was put in there twice in the bottom of the second paragraph. So that's the only correction I've got to those meetings, minutes, but uh, anybody else have any comments on them? Okay. Well, let's move on to the dashboard, one of our favorite topics. And I know that operations is going to be talking about this one too uh, in their meeting. And so Rebecca, can you give us kind of a briefing on where we are? Uh, sure. Good after or good morning still, everyone. Um, I have a, what I'd like to do today is just share my, my own thinking and hopefully get some reaction from the subcommittee um, on the topic of just um, the recommendations we'd like to make to RTD on, on financial transparency. Um, I'm glad you mentioned Daya and I, I see her on uh, because Daya and the operations committee has been doing a lot of work on some thinking around performance dashboards. So sort of as a, a starting point, I think um, our subcommittee should focus its work on the sort of financial transparency so that we've got um, recommendations that sort of fall within that bucket. And I think there's good connections with the work of operations um, and the performance dashboards they're looking at. But I think, I think we can build out um, two sets of recommendations there. So Daya, maybe I'll, I'll just ask you if, if that makes sense from a starting point just on how um, our two committees can tackle this. Yeah. Hi, Rebecca. Hi, everyone. Hi. Um, I think that makes a lot of sense. The Just as a reminder to this committee at our last joint meeting, um, where it was the Finance and the Operations Committee, North Highlands had facilitated a conversation around what some potential metrics might be. So in the operations, um, yes, we will be focusing on some of the, the like service delivery operations fairs and, and more of those metrics, but I think it makes a lot of sense for finance to focus on the financial reporting and um, transparency uh, measures. Okay. All right, so, so based on that, what I'd like to throw out to the group and get some input on is sort of um, three categories of recommendations I would propose we, we look into and flush out. Um, and I, no pride of authorship here, um, really would, would love some input. But in, in kind of looking through and spending quite a bit of time on the, the RTD website, these are, these are the three buckets I identified. Um, first is just, I, I think we could build some recommendations around the need for just simpler budget information um, that is also contextual on the RTD site. Um, there is no shortage of financial information um, on the site now. But I, I think there's, there's almost too much. You can get very lost in just a ton of spreadsheets uh, and links. And um, what well, at least I had trouble is finding sort of the bigger picture. And so I think some tools like a one sheet budget that really is a simple breakdown um, of the overall budget and give the reader an understanding of, of the total budget available and the expenses. Um, I, I think it'd be good to have some public information and maybe it's on there, I couldn't find it just on how the budget is adopted and what the role of the board of directors is, um, how that budget aligns with the mission and goals of, of RTD. And I know General Manor Johnson is, is working on 
some new um, goals and performance objectives that I think it'd be nice to connect the budget to that. And then lastly, kind of within that category, just sort of a layman's overview of the budget itself. Um, what, what revenue streams, you know, what, what does fare box revenue mean? Um, how, how do you sort of understand the sources and revenue for RTD and the major expenses? So that was my, I, and I, I don't think this would necessarily involve dashboards or anything. It's really just um, simpler descriptions uh, and uh, kind of standalone budget documents in one sheet. Um, that's different from a full dashboard that tracks individual investments and things like fast tracks. And, and I had a great conversation with Doug McLeod about that a couple of weeks ago. And I know RTD is um, interested in, in putting out an RFP that would help them develop that. Um, so I was focused more on just easier things that could be done in the short term. So may, maybe, well, I'll run through all three of these and then maybe we can have discussion. The, the second bucket I looked at was um, the Fast Tracks website uh, actually is, is really quite nice on the RTD site, I thought, but it's hard to make the connection between the budget information that's on the financials page with Fast Tracks. And just given all the scrutiny and public interest and in understanding that, I think it'd be good to make that connection um, to, to understand what the shortfalls are, what the FISA account is, uh, just for some, some public uh, awareness there. And then the third issue I flagged is just around the ongoing stimulus dollars coming in, um, providing additional transparency on what the long-term vision is for those, especially as those dollars begin to exceed or consistently exceed the sort of budget gap created by COVID and the recession. I think there's quite a bit there um, that the public would be interested in. So those are, those are my um, impressions and proposal. If I'm open to input and I think if, if this is somewhat on the right track, we could begin to flush these out into recommendations. So fire away. <laughs> There is, there is one in particular that I thought that is, is very useful. I think it might be behind a firewall, I'm not sure. But there is a, is a website, there, I'm sorry, there is a webpage that uh, talks about um, a lot of the parameters of each one of the lines individually. And uh, I can provide you a, a link to that page, but it's something I've used extensively. It, it's basically, an annual report on uh, on operations and uh, uh, provides the the number of boardings and the and the expenses of each one of those and and uh, uh, what it calls subsidies, which are basically the RTD's cost of providing each one of those uh, boarding boardings, and it, it's really just a wealth of information mm -hmm. and. I would hope that there would be a way to, if it is behind a, uh, any kind of a firewall, to make that available to the public. It's also a critical tool that RTD uses in deciding which lines it, it cuts back on. And so for that reason in particular, since so many people are very interested in why their particular service has been reduced, uh, it would be a useful way for them to be able to look at that. And that's all I want to say about that. Okay. <laughs> so I would encourage other people to speak up here. I know, uh, Dea, that your group and also working uh, with North Highland has come up with a pretty solid uh, group of suggestions and, and how we might do this. It's good to see the kind of cross-committee cooperation that we've been able to mm -hmm. accomplish with this. And we really appreciate that. I'm sure the fueling is mutual. So who would like to who would like to comment on this or add to it? Yes, Ron. Right, thank you. Um, thanks, Rebecca. This is helpful. I will I will say as as um, as I have sort of reviewed a number of different RTD budgets from the last several years, um, I, there is a ton of information in those budgets and it's very, very detailed. 
but as a non-financial person, um, I, I agree with, with you. I think you're on the right track here that um, uh, some tool by RTD, a, a one-page budget, a, a more of a summary table, something higher level would be really helpful just to be able to, for the general public and for stakeholders and partner agencies to really e more easily grasp sort of the financial situation and the major um, revenue and spending categories for RTD. So would, would just um, kind of uh, echo that. I think, you're, I think you're on the right path. I, I would add to that the audits as well. Uh, I think there's mm -hmm. useful information in the audits, but boy, it takes some financial chops to be able to get through all of that. <laughs> and there must be easier ways to get that data out and summarize it. So. Hey, Rick, this yeah. is um, I just wanted to jump in and um, I think a question that we all, we all wrestle with as committee members is really who, what is the, the challenge or the opportunity that we're trying to unlock by, by providing these documents? Because I, I think one question that's coming up for me is even if we put a one pager out, who is the intended audience? Is it the everyday resident or is it another elected official so I, I think being really clear about the challenge that we're trying to address and who the audience is I think is going to be helpful in determining what metrics or or how we present the information out to the general public so that's just one thing I, I do think it makes a lot of sense and I know even from an advocacy standpoint um, I mean, I have an MPA and it's hard for me to read the budget sometimes. And that's all I did was look at city budget, and government budget. So it does take some like real in-depth understanding of what a municipal or government budget looks like to, to unpack it a little bit. Um, so I guess if we can just figure out a way and, and maybe this will be part of the equity assessment actually in mm -hmm. thinking about what information do communities actually want to see? What's that body, What's that one picture look like? And what does it look like for um, someone that works in gover local governments? And so, sorry, it was a little bit of a rambling thought, but I was certainly just thinking about what does this look like in practicality as well. And, and there, there are really two things. The other thing is all that in-depth information. You can't just present the summary and not also prevent, provide access to the people that are prepared to take a deep dive. That's part of it. it. It is really tough to try to design something like this. And I, I appreciate the challenges and difficulties of it. It, it might be the, the best route to go here is to, uh, to not, just, uh, not just try to figure out exactly what it should be and then build it. It may be to build a prototype that shows what it looks like without necessarily having all the bells and whistles and connections. And then, and then do some focus groups with people mm -hmm. from the community that represent both the people that, that need to be able to get down deep into it and also some ordinary users that are more interested in what's going on with, you know, why are my buses late and things like that. Agree. Okay. Not that they're ever late, I'm not saying that, but if they were. <laughs> so. Uh, Could I just add a comment? Absolutely, at least always. Uh, and I, I mainly want to agree with what I've heard, um, but with an emphasis on that the sort of the, the first entry into the the you know the web page should be for the non-expert, um, the non um, MBAs. Um, with the link and go deeper for additional information um, so that you so you can solve the problem of having something that everybody can understand has the basics essentials um, that are easily digestible and has the ability um, to provide the more in-depth detail because I think as was pointed out there's a lot of folks a lot of different categories of users that are going to be interested in information around financial metrics and they're gonna, some people are gonna wanna do a deep dive and we shouldn't completely um, get rid of the, that wealth of information, but we should layer it in a way that not everybody has to wade through it if they just want a basic understanding. 
Yeah. I was on a board once with a guy who said, who always said, if you're not thinking market segments, you're not thinking. And, and the point of that is that in this case, we've got very different market segments. We have the more casual users and we have the deep dive folks. So, and we may have several others, I don't know. It's hard to be all things to all people. But it, I guess to follow up on, on Dea and Elisa's point, I, I was sort of trying to channel, if I was a member of the general public and had sort of heard that RTD was facing these budget issues, how quickly could I get on their website and try to figure out what that meant? Right. And I, I think that's sort of what Elise is saying. You need a good entry point that someone could get on there for five minutes and go, oh, okay, I kind of get it. And, and a, a state legislator or uh, someone else, that's a much different audience and you need to have that information so they can go down the, the rabbit hole there. But mm -hmm. being able to catch just, just someone <laughs> off the street who is interested, I think would be a good step forward. Great. Hey, Ron. Yeah, Dan. Why well, I, I agree with uh, everything that's being said uh, in my, uh, you know, attempts to find information on RTD's website, I, you know, there's lots of information there uh, readily available, but I think having uh, you know some some kind of narrative about what does the information mean, uh, what are what are the trends, what are the challenges, what are the opportunities, and, and what is RTD doing about those? Uh, that information may be available, but uh, I I really didn't find it. And uh, something like everybody else has said that you know it's kind of one stop shopping. You go one place. There's very high level summaries with some things you can click on to get more information about certain topics and then links to all the detailed information, I think would be very helpful for people. Yes. And do we have any comments from people other than just the committee members? If anybody would like to make a comment, we have a little more time before we move on. You know, I can never see raised hands, so. Um, yes, Ron. Sorry, not. A, I guess a question for the subcommittee, maybe for next steps on this. How would how would Rebecca suggest we sort of move forward with this to um, start to formulate uh, kind of a, a, a recommendation from the subcommittee around these ideas, or in this case, subcommittees? <laughs> I know Dea's group has done a lot of work on this too, as has North Highland. Okay. Any other comments? If not, we'll move on. Uh, Ron, I know that you included the um, PowerPoint that I think the, the, uh, it's gonna be used at the next uh, board meeting for, for RTD in the, in the materials. Um, I don't know if you wanna comment on that some yeah, happy to happy to do that, Rhett. Um, we did include in the agenda packet um, information from um, from RTD for a discussion with um, their um, uh, planning and capital ca planning capital programs and fast tracks um, subcommittee. Uh, that was actually uh, last evening. Um, so the information is in there. Uh, RTD staff is invited to do sort of kind of replicate that presentation to this subcommittee at its next meeting in two weeks, um, but wanted to ha have you have a uh, preview of that materials in preparation for that discussion in a couple of weeks. Um, Matthew um, listened in on that meeting last night, and I think there was a lot of attendance. I think um, Rebecca may have attended um, a good chunk of that as well. So sounds like there was a very robust conversation um, around sort of options for RTD to pursue um, around um, Northwest Rail sort of next steps to keep it progressing. And um, understand that um, of the um, several options that were provided that the subcommittee gave direction to RTD to pursue option two, which is about, um, and I'll invite Deborah or other RTD staff to correct me, I think it's estimated to be about a five to $8 million 
um, effort, sort of a planning and environmental linkages uh, sort of analysis for the corridor. Um, taking about 12 to 24 months. And so just that's my 60,000 foot um, level intro to that and much more detail will be presented at the finance committee in two weeks. Okay. Uh, do we have any other, Rebecca, you were in on that one. Do you have any observations you want to share? Uh, I, I uh, only had so much stamina. I think I made it till about eight o'clock last night, but it, it was a, a good discussion and um, really appreciate the thought RTD is putting into that. I, I wasn't there for the final vote, um, but so I appreciate Ron's summary. And by uh, option two, that's the planning and environmental linkages study. That's correct. Good. Hopefully I didn't hopefully I didn't step all over that, Deborah, or anyone else from RTD. I was just gonna say a point of clarity. There was no vote. We were apprising the board of what our path forward would be as we look at leveraging a solicitation to do that work. And so around the topic last night, there was the discussion and more or less um, support from the board in relationship to what we do do, it would end up being at a level two, but we will come back to the board once we leverage a um, a proposal that we would like them to act upon, enabling us to utilize FISA money. So this will be a recurring discussion, many to come. Great. So thank you. Thank you for that clarifying detail. Good, Lynn. Yeah, I would just say that um, uh, the board did express uh, support for level two, I think as, as uh, Deborah was saying, and, and uh, the thought is that, that we need a common set of facts. And level two was kind of the, uh, I'm kind of quoting Deborah from last night, but, but it's one that we've been saying. Level two is, uh, uh, level one would have not have had the kind of robust community engagement and transparency through that community engagement that um, I think the board felt like we need to get to um, a, a place where people trust the ridership numbers, trust the cost numbers, can look at, you know, the sightings and the effects on the various towns and things like that. So, um, you know, I, I think that uh, there was pretty, there's certainly not um, a decision to move forward on Northwest Rail that, you know, that the board has expressed a decision either way on that, but I think pretty um, substantial support for getting the facts and, and spending some of the FISA money to get there. Very good. Yes, Elise. I just had a question and I apologize that I wasn't able to tune in last night to hear the discussion and it sounds like it was robust and helpful. Um, the work that will, assuming one goes forward, the RTD board votes to go forward with this path, is that information that would be um, feed into any front range passenger rail effort or I'm just, I'm wondering about the, the um, utility of the information that's going to be collected and how it might be useful in different, um, uh, with different opportunities. If I may speak to that. Um, so in reference to the information we put forward, the whole intent here is to work in collaboration. And if we can optimize efficiencies in doing so, that's the intent. Having had meetings with Front Range Passenger Rail, with Southwest Chief Representatives, um, in addition to meeting with a lot of different stakeholders, the intent behind all of this is that we would uh, explore entering into an MOU where we talk about collaborative efforts going full steam ahead. And so with that, all of this will be done in tandem in a public forum whereby everybody's cognizant of what that is to best you know, reach a amicable solution uh, for that corridor. Very good. Thank you. So, uh, Ron, are we ready to move on to the PowerPoint? Is there Actually, could I ask one other question? Sure. To follow up on General Manager Johnson's um, recent remarks there, um, and also Lynn's. 
the decision hasn't been made to move forward with Northwest Rail, but the thinking is this level of study then would create the opportunity to have the discussion and the decision about whether and how and on what time frame to move forward with Northwest Rail. That is ultimately correct because right now we're dealing in ambiguity. So that's why we need to move forward. So we all have, as Lynn said, I said last night, the common set of facts because we don't even know what an operation plan would look like with BNSF until we do this one piece. So we need to do this as the springboard for any other discussions that are to come. And Thanks. I'll, just, I'll just add one thing that, uh, you know, this week, Amtrak came out with a, a map of its desired areas to, uh, that it would like to add rail lines. And uh, one of those was the front range passenger rail uh, route. So I think that the board feels like, and staff, that um, this is a moment in time that uh, um, there could be money available out there. Um, we met, uh, Deborah and I and some others joined the Northwest Mayors and Commissioners Coalition in their virtual meetings with all of our delegation, congressional delegation, and uh, FTA, FRA, Amtrak, and uh, you know, there's certainly a different level of ex excitement back there right now, and potential for you know, obviously with the infrastructure uh, bill coming out, there's a, I believe it's a request by Amtrak for 80 billion dollars, which is a huge amount for Amtrak. Um, so I think people feel like that while you know, putting this money into it, if there were no options out there, um, could be a futile task. Working with Front Range Passenger Rail and Amtrak um, opens some, some potential doors. That's a lot of billions. That's a lot of billions. <laughs> I don't know what our slice of that's gonna be, but that's a lot of billions. That's encouraging. So any, any other comments from anyone? Good. Okay, uh, Ron, can, uh, can I get the screen? You, you should be able to do that, Rhett. All right, just let me, let me just start by saying that um, one of the toughest issues that we've had to face is that this issue of Northwest Rail and where that's headed. And uh, it's certainly something I've spent a lot of time trying to, uh, trying to get my arms around and trying to understand is, you know, as the chair of the finance subcommittee, it's probably in, in our terms, the biggest issue that's out there. And, uh, and I've come to some conclusions and they may not be anyone else's conclusions, but I, I think that there's, uh, there's a certain amount of analysis behind them that I hope will, uh, will spur people to take a hard look at this. And so with that said, let me put up my PowerPoint. Can everyone see this? Uh, no, we can't see it yet, Rhett. Hmm, interesting. It'll be hard to run it if you can't see it. Let's see, oh, probably because it might be in the wrong place. Hold on a sec. Oh, technology. Yeah, 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 I know, I know. Is this where it should be? Ron and I did this earlier as a practice. It seemed to work. It did work. I'm gonna try that again. You didn't have the pressure of an audience though. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess that makes a difference. So you're not seeing it at all, huh? No. And I did click I, share screen. I can Let share my... Let me try that again, the shared screen bit. Okay. And... Um, Back to this. Tell me if anybody sees any part of it at any stage of the game. How about now? No. Ron, I'm going to give it to you and we're just going to do the next slide, please. 
Okay. The, nothing like a, a test and trial that tells us nothing. <laughs> Have you got it up now? You should be able to see it. Uh, I can certainly see it. Can everyone else see it? I see a thumbs up from a couple folks. Good. Okay, there are there are basically two parts to the research that I've done, and these will be appendices to a recommendation. Uh, and it's basically uh, looking at the three Northwest Rail proposals and trying to do some economics on those and look at their economic viability. So a key accountability, RT accountability <coughs> assignment from uh, Governor Polis and the legislature was to determine how RTD can achieve long-term financial stability and growth while still meeting its core mission. And that's my biggest concern. And I, I think it's been a big concern for RTD too in, in line B, the Northwest Rail Extension. How do we do that? in a way that that helps and also helps ensure that we'll be able to continue to meet our budgets in the future. The governor and the legislature basically uh, have said that the, the current plans, you know, where you essentially wait until you paid off the debt in the original 2050 timeline, 2042 timelines, they're, I think, unwilling to accept that concept. And so the, the question I tried to answer, is there a cost-effective alternative solution that can meet or exceed those 20, 2004 fast tax, fast tax promises without putting RTD's future at risk? Next slide. So this is before the pandemic. Uh, the fast tracks rail network, the 2019 sort of uh, time frame. The Fast Tracks Rail Network has been financed basically uh, over the years by using the 0.4% sales and use tax revenue as collateral. And if you look at some of those loans, uh, they have recourse to that sales tax if anything, you know, if you were not able to meet your obligations. If you look at, at today's uh, revenue, it is two thirds of that uh, fast tracks, uh, sales tax revenue is consumed by debt payments. And if you look in 2020, RTD paid five times as much for interest as principal on its debt. And that debt burden is, is not going to go away anytime soon at that rate. So in 2019, the fares that we collected only covered a sixth of the operating cost. And that is without including the interest expense. And so that's, that is a pretty tough situation to be in. Next slide, please. Ron, can I get the next slide? Oh, here we go. Okay, the three proposals. Uh, the first one is the collaboration with Front Range Passenger Rail, which could provide some rides for, for the Northwest Corridor. The Northwest Rail Rush Hour Only Rail Service Proposal and the build out, full build out of the Northwest Rail Line and Line B Extension. Next slide. So here's basically uh, the information that uh, I've been able to glean on the collaboration with Front Range Passenger Rail. Uh, it's a 1.5 to 2.5 uh, billion were the estimates for what's called a starter service. And that's the Colorado Springs to Fort Collins. And the Boulder route uh, is one of the routes and three routes being considered. So this would be the one that would actually be able to provide some service uh, to the Northwest Corridor. Uh, there are uh, two, between two and six round trips per day that they're talking about with that uh, particular um, starter service. And unfortunately, it only stops in Boulder and Longmont. It goes from uh, Union Station, 
as a stop in Boulder and a stop in Longmont. So it's kind of a modest contribution to that 15 to 30 minute Northwest Rail promise that was uh, the original Fast Tracks promise. It uses the Burlington Northern Santa Fe tracks. And so it has to share that with freight traffic. And, uh, and the uh, reference that I had was they were looking at five to 10 years at the soonest to be able to do this front range passenger rail starter service. And uh, I, I would say that, you know, if all of a sudden we get full funding from uh, Uncle Sam, then maybe that's faster, but it's, you know, it, it, is, it is somewhat in the future. The full vision that, uh, that basically goes all the way down to Pueblo and all the way up into Cheyenne and connects into uh, the larger uh, rail network. Uh, the, the comment was that it looked like about eight to $14 billion and 20 to 30 years out. Now, obviously if it's fully funded, then if it's eight to 14 and, and they're gonna come up with all of that, then that's great, but it, it's not cheap. And, uh, you know, having gone through a lot of transit funding and transportation funding uh, initiative processes. I don't think that we're going to find that in Colorado, but we may be able to find it in Washington. And if we do, that's terrific. Next slide. So this is next slide. It looks like the same slide. Good. Northwest Rail Rush Hour Only Rail Service. This was to provide. Can I get the next slide? There, stop there. <laughs> so Northwest Rail Rush Hour Only Rail Service. Uh, it was three morning, one way Longmont, Denver, Boulder trips and three return trips in the afternoon, evening. And this is a, uh, down the uh, 36 corridor. Uh, and so if you look at that, it's weekends only uh, the estimated capital cost on that, the most recent numbers that I was able to find was $708 million. These are $2018. And if you, if you add on the interest, assume that as we do with most of these, it's going to be a, a uh, bonding or a loan, then even at 2% interest, it's $1.132 billion. The operating and maintenance cost estimates for that from RTD are $13.5 million. The killer here is the estimated daily ridership. It's like 800 users, 1,600 trips, 1,600 boardings. And if you look at that, the effective cost per boarding would be $128. And I, I don't, I just can't understand how that would be something we would be able to justify. It's just too, too far out of whack in terms of boarding. But let's move on to the next slide. And this is the, the build out of Northwest Rail Extension. So RTD estimated 5,400 weekday boardings by 2035. So just to try to make this work, uh, I double that ridership estimate, uh, basically to 10,800 boardings. And if you do that, uh, you'll still get only get to about 3.37 million trips a year. Uh, I do make the assumption here that weekend ridership is about half of weekday ridership and that it would also be providing services on the weekend. I ignored the issue of holidays, which would reduce the trips per year uh, more. But the estimated capital cost, it, you know, it's a, it's generally, you'll see 1.5 to 1.7 billion. So I use 1.6 billion. Those again are $2018. Uh, over, over 30 years at 2% interest, the total cost of that is $2.56 billion. Operating and maintenance costs, 20.6 million per year. RTD's cost per boarding works out to about 31 dollars and 42 cents a year. But, you know, those numbers are, are uh, based on some assumptions. It could be more than that. 
it could be less than that. The average rail fare uh, throughout Fast Tracks was about $2.08. Uh, if you look at that and you look at the annual cost of that, could we get back to that? Good. It, it works out to a net cost that RTD would have to absorb of, uh, of $99 million a year. And uh, I, don't, I don't see where that funding's going to come from. I, you know, I, one thing I want to emphasize is I would welcome people to go in and look, the, not at the slideshow, but at the detailed, uh, detailed materials in the agenda packet. Uh, and and just show me where I'm wrong about this. I would love to be wrong about this, but if it's 99 billion dollars million dollars a year, uh, the only way possible would be if if the government, basically, if Uncle Sam picked up the whole tab on building this thing, and and that's a scenario that I suppose is possible, but I think it's a tough one to get to. We'll see how good our our representatives in Washington are. Okay, let's go on to the next slide. Ron, next slide, please. So why is North West Rail so expensive? Well, something, something people sometimes miss is it's 45% of the length of all the other fast track rail that we built uh, in, uh, in RTD's whole fast tracks network. It's a long line. Uh, it's late. It was supposed to be finished by 2015. It's, if it's pushed out, uh, every time it's pushed out, the cost goes up because rail is not getting cheaper to build. If we didn't double the RTD ridership, the projected cost per boarding would be $62 of boarding. The 2024 estimate of 565 million that's already more than tripled and is, is going to not get better if it's pushed out further. The cost to use the Burlington Northern Santa Fe Rail, the right of way, was higher, I think, by a pretty significant amount than was originally inspected, expected uh, when this was being discussed in, in 2004. And then the Federal Railroad Administration, uh, because it's sharing tracks. Uh, or, or in the right of way uh, required commuter rail instead of light rail uh, related to safety issues. So there are a lot of things that went into making Northwest Rail as expensive as it is to build. Next slide, please. So Northwest Rail's financial impact on RTD. Northwest Rail, it's, it's commuter rail. Commuter rail is uh, significantly more expensive than, uh, than uh, light rail. Uh, if you look at the three commuter rail lines that have been operating uh, over a year, uh, they average about $18 of boarding. And you compare that to regional buses at $6 of boarding and $5 for the Flatiron Flyer. And it's just, it's just very, commuter rail is very expensive by its nature. So based on the recent estimated cost of Northwest Rail, uh, if, you, if you look at it, that unfunded liability of $99 million that it would put on RTD's budget is just uh, hard, to, hard to imagine how we're going to absorb that. Even if it's totally paid for, there's going to be a big number that goes on uh, these things. Even if the capital cost is paid, you still got operating expenses and it's gonna I think cost a fair amount. Okay, let's uh let's go on. So in conclusion, if there isn't an alternative modern model like that 100 percent federal funding, I just don't see how it's gonna be uh an economically sustainable thing for RTD to carry that carry that burden. And that's one of the key things that the RTD Accountability Committee needs to, needs to resolve is how do we create an, an economically sustainable RTD for the long run? So next slide. 
Bob. Could I get the next slide, please? Thank you. So here's here are the original 2004 Fast Tracks plan promises. And I know not many of you were associated with RTD in 2004, it was a long time ago. But uh, estimated completion date uh, was 2015, cost 565 million. And the promise was a Denver Boulder service, 15 minute peak, 30 minute off peak, and a Longmont Boulder service, 30 minutes all day. Double tracks to Denver, between Denver and Boulder, and a single track between Boulder and Longmont. The technology then was diesel locomotives hauling coaches. And so those were the original promises that were made. And you hear a lot about promises made and not kept. Ron? So the, the question is, is there a cost-effective alternative solution that could be delivered within a decade? I mean, even if we got full funding for, um, for line B, I don't, I don't know how long it would take to build, but this is, this is really the question. Is there some other path we can, we can get to, Ron? Next slide, please. Sorry, Rod, there's just a little bit of a lag sometimes. I'm, I'm clicking. Okay, I trust you. <laughs> so trainer transit, how long are you willing to wait? There are people in the Northwest Corridor that by God, they want to train. And that's the only thing that they may ever be satisfied with. But think about this. Is there really an alternative that could provide this a fast, frequent, comfortable, safe, reliable transit that would, that would begin right away providing some of that service and would continuously get better and eventually surpass the promises uh, made uh, in 2004? And if it's not a train, is that acceptable? So instead of a single path Dinder Boulder Longmont train, the, the recommendation here, which is not something that I just came up with, this, this basically is some recommendations that have already been made, is to build a, a grid of bus rapid transit. And, and that I believe can, can exceed the fast tracks promises. And it would be spread across the Northwest corridor instead of being this single track. So flat iron flyer, uh, that has proved to be a very popular mode of transportation. Next slide, please. The problem was that we really chopped back services in a big way. And, and it was basically because of the financial crisis that, uh, that RTD was facing. Uh, you know, I'm not saying it wasn't something we had to do, but it certainly had a big impact on Flatiron Flyer. And uh, this was the service before the, uh, the crisis that we hit. And, uh, and it's way, way down from here. And I think the first step in this bus rapid transit ought to be restoring service to its pre-pandemic levels. And this is you know, this is uh, uh, actually exceeds what the two uh, two track between Denver and Union Station plan under Line B is in terms of frequency of service. Next slide. And then by tapping some some CRISA and FISA funds right away to make sure that we can get a quick start before Washington. Uh, hopefully comes through with uh, the bulk of the funding. Uh, finish all the planning that's needed to ensure that uh, that the Boulder Longmont BRT is really shovel ready when the American Jobs Plan Act, assuming 50 Democrats will vote for it, gets their funding. And this is just a brief look at what those that line would look like. And uh, and at the bottom, you can see uh, what the cross section of it is. It, they're managed lanes and it says BRT slash managed lanes. So remember, there's gonna be a lot of traffic, a lot of traffic, fair amount of traffic 
uh, that if you've got two people or more, you're going to be able to use those lanes. And, and in those lanes, uh, it, it actually has some great advantages to the congestion that we're otherwise uh, seeing more of on 119. And so it's going to relieve congestion on 119 for years to come, I think. And, uh, and at the same time, provide the pathways for BRT. One of the great things about bus rapid transit is it uses the infrastructure, even if there aren't managed lanes, that we've already got built. And if we do need to build managed lanes, then those managed lanes are going to alleviate traffic, not just for the people that are using transit, but for everybody, for the people that are just commuting as well. And so that's a, that's a big big benefit. It's one of the reasons why CDOT is willing to pick up a substantial part of the cost of that. Next slide. So the recommendation here is that while you've got all the construction disruption on 119 and, and they're building that out, you could provide a BRT service basically using US 287 and then across on US 7 to provide the access to the people of Longmont who need to be able to uh, connect into that US 36 Flatiron Flyer service. And so the recommendation here is rather than just trying to shoehorn in with all the construction on 119, instead run it down 287 and over on uh, State Highway 7. Next slide. So RTD and CDOT planners uh, should be hard at work listening to and learning from the leaders and the future customers in, in, uh, in the Northwest Corridor to, to really complete all of the preparation and, and design and other issues and application and going after all the funding for State Highway 7 BRT and US 287 BRT projects. And um, after that, there'll be other potential BRT uh, uh, lines that we would want to include in Northwest Corridor. But the point here is we need a grid of BRT lines that will do more than just what we're doing uh, with uh, the line B uh, Northwest Rail. So is this affordable? The average 2019 Flatiron Flyer BRT cost was $4 and could be 94 cents <laughs> per boarding. That's half of Fast Track's rail service average. And that's not just the, the uh, high-end rail, that's all the rail within fast tracks. And it's a dollar less than RTD's regional bus boarding cost. And the service, the access for this is, is this RTD service performance 2019. All these numbers are pre-pandemic. Uh, and you have to look at route FF, which isn't always immediately apparent. But this is, this is the, the uh, was a source for a lot of information that was very useful in doing this analysis and something that should be accessible from our dashboard. Would you go back up to the previous slide for a second, please, Ron? So uh, it is a sixth of the estimated Northwest rail cost per boarding. And, uh, and that's at double the estimated RTD ridership for Northwest rail. And that construction cost is again, shared with CDOT and so those managed lanes are a great way to reduce congestion uh, for everyone, not just the people using transit. Next slide. So ridership is the key to success. And it, it's also the metric by which RTE is going to be measured under the, the, uh, the new legislation that's going through. Nothing's going to matter more than to the cost of transit and ridership. Ridership is the denominator in, in your... Uh, cost per boarding. And so it's, it's not enough to assume that if you build it, they will come. 
One of the things that we're working on in the RTD accountability are some ideas for first last mile strategies to boost the use of transit. The things we're working on there apply just as much to Northwest Rail and I'm sorry, to the BRT, this grid of BRT lines. And it, it really is one way to help ensure that the communities that aren't gonna get stations and then still have efficient access to this Northwest corridor grid of BRT lines. Go ahead, next slide. So I just wanna say that, that if you think these are my ideas, you, you couldn't be more wrong. There's a lot of work that's gone into ideas of how you can build out this kind of a grid of, uh, of BRT lines and how it could serve the North Mess corridors. And it, from a lot of different sources, a lot of people have, have put a lot of work into this. And there's also a lot of individuals that have been uh, very helpful to me in, in educating me in understanding the challenges that we're faced with here. That said, any errors are mine alone. And I really encourage anyone on this call or anyone else uh, in, who has a strong interest in this to contact me and uh, let me know uh, if you find any errors, I, I would be more than willing to, to try to resolve them. Uh, but uh, assuming this is a reasonable analysis, I think it's a really great opportunity for, for these BRT lines to not just do what the line B would have done, but to, to really surpass uh, the promises of line B. Ron? I think that's it. We will get another one. Good. Let me get that window back over here. Zoom meeting. There we go. Good. Thanks. And I am, I recognize this won't necessarily be the most popular talk you've ever heard and that uh, there are a lot of different opinions on the subject, but uh, I have a responsibility to, to uh, uh, do the best that I can in trying to present what I perceive to be not just the facts of this, but the opportunity that's there. And I think there is a lot of opportunity in BRT. I think when you look at the popularity that we've seen with, uh, um, with the Flatiron Flyer, it's an example of what, uh, what that potential is. So give me your tough questions, please. Kristen. I would just like to make two comments. Uh, when I was in high school, back in the dark ages, in mid-1980s, I lived in Lafayette, but I went to high school in Denver. And every day, my father drove me to the Broomfield Park and Ride, and I picked up a bus that dropped me at 54th and Federal. And this was a coach similar to, it, it was a regional route, uh, way before Union Station was completed. I, I'm sure Civic Center was there, but I went directly from Broomfield to 54th and Federal, and I'm sure they went on to probably Civic Center. But it was a very nice coach. It was similar to, not as fancy as the, uh, the busting, um, or the Flatiron Flyer, but it was a nice, comfortable coach. It was, it was, it, I was actually able to do my homework on the bus. So it was a nice way you, you could read a book, you could do whatever you needed to do, you could take a nap. So that was, that was a great little bit of transportation for someone who did not drive. The second comment is in the April Jeffco LCC, there was a very warm conversation about what are we going to do about the Northwest Rail? We can't. Was it, was it a warm conversation or a heated conversation? Oh, we were heated. 
I, I was I was being polite when I said warm. There really is no way for the Northwest White Rail to be affordable at this time. And all of us, uh, well, the majority of us were saying, let's do the BRT. Let's really support the BRT. It is a much more affordable way to go. It is just as comfortable. It can be, um, of course, we have to make sure that it runs on time and that it is dependable. But all I would say the majority of that of, of the local coordinating council was saying we really need to push for the BRT instead of the Northwest Rail Line. Okay, there's one opinion. Thanks, Kristen. Could, could I get feedback from some of the other folks here? Yeah, I have my hand raised. Okay, please. I, 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 now that I've learned how to raise my hand, I always feel obligated to do it, but I'm more of a. <laughs> feel free in. to wave. Anybody should wave, not because I can't right. see raised hands on this for whatever reason on this. Uh, okay. Well, I, Brad, I appreciate the presentation and, and how much um, uh, work that you've spent on di diving deep into this. This is a big issue for my corridor, yeah, Lynn's corridor, um, this, and it's not an easy issue. Um, and yes, the solution is expensive. I will take a, a moment to note that I, I don't think the whole fast track system business plan is that sustainable, even without Northwest Rail, the debt load is high, operating costs are high. We have more work to do on that period. That aside, um, my priority when I wear my Boulder County hat is to make the Northwest Corridor whole for the promises that were made in 2004 and obviously to do so in a way that doesn't bankrupt RTD because that would, that would not, uh, not uh, serve anyone's purpose, but do so in a way that, that provides some, some fairness to our corridor. And, um, a couple of things. One is if front range passenger rail happens, then it's a no brainer that it should follow the Northwest rail alignment. And we should lobby the feds to help us out with construction. And it's a much bigger project that's sort of statewide or state length, um, has a lot of coalition partners, a lot of communities, a lot of ridership, and we should take advantage of that. So I think that is something that um, this community, uh, this uh, committee should endorse and embrace that we should try to jump on that train, uh, metaphorically, literally. Um, I also think that that the prior discussion that we heard from RTD about moving forward with studies, we have the voters were promised something in 2004. And if we're gonna change that, we need to go back to the region and get regional buy-in. And the first step in doing that is coming up with this common set of facts around ridership costs and time. Because I think, and, and right, you said it right. If we, if we have to wait forever to get a train, is that, is that a worthwhile trade-off? If it's gonna to cost too much, is that a worthwhile trade-off? We, until we agree on those numbers, um, we can't have that regional conversation. I don't think this committee can have that regional conversation for its on on its own. This this committee doesn't have that authority, nor would it nor would it work. Um, yeah. That is something where there's going to have to be a heated, spirited, robust conversation that will be data driven by the facts that are kind of come out through this additional study. I do think this committee could recommend that that regional conversation happen once that data is provided so that the region could decide how it wants to be made whole when it has all of the, the facts in front of it. So and I think that's something that- the briefly committee... say that is exactly the recommendation that will come out of all this work. It won't be that RTD, you need to do this. It will be that RTD, you need to get together with the people of the Northwest Corridor and say, here is an alternative, or uh, this is one of the issues, one of the uh, ideas that are being discussed. 
and get that engagement and get that feedback. Go ahead. So, so then just to, to wrap up, and I don't mean to, to be on a soapbox, but you know how it is, a, you know, recovering politician. Um, <laughs> Separate from Northwest Rail, bus rapid transit is a great tool. It's cost effective. Um, it's a way to, it's a happy marriage between roads and transit and, it, and we should take advantage of it wherever <coughs> we can. So the, the part of your presentation that embraced the Northwest Area Mobility Study and suggested we need to get on with that, I'm, I'm totally on board with. And I think we should do that regardless. Uh, and while we wait, um, to figure out rail, um, which was the agreement in the Northwest Area Mobility Study. So I'm all on board on that as, as more funding flows. I think that that's appropriate because the Northwest Corridor has been waiting for a long time. Longmont has been waiting for a long time to move forward as expeditiously as possible with, with um, doing the 119 BRT and, and queuing up State Highway 7 and, and US 287 as well. So I agree with that. And I guess I, in terms of next steps, I would suggest that, and I'm looking at you, Ron, sorry to say, <laughs> if Dr. Cog could take the work you've done, Rut, take the input we've got, the conversation, what we've heard from RTD, and, and, and put together a short set of recommendations that fall along the lines of the, the interchange we just had, Rut, about uh, talking with the region, but also front range passenger rail um, I think that that would be the appropriate sort of next step for this subcommittee to take. I think I saw Ron sign on to that. He said he was going, no, maybe, there we go. We got a thumb up. Yeah, you know, uh, I, I certainly don't, uh, don't claim to have all wisdom and knowledge of these, of these things, but I just, I just can't get past the economics. I just have really struggled to try to get past the economics. And, and so um, if someone can help me get past that, then I certainly can, can uh, look at it differently. But again, we are, we are the accountability committee. Our job is, is to recommend. It is not to say you do this. Uh, it is ultimately RTD's decision and how they move forward. But as you said, I think the solution is to move forward with broader discussion of what the options are. But this option ought to be on the table too. Uh, Doug, Ron, you guys have any uh, comments on this? Um, I, th I think we've, we've definitely learned a lot over the last several months about RTD's financial situation, the cost of all the unfinished fast tracks. Um, I think the work that the accountability committee had done setting out the focus areas highlighted Northwest Rail, but in the context of all the unfinished fast tracks corridors. And I think we're happy to sort of be your scribes and take a, take a first cut based on everything we've heard and all the research that's been done over the last several months to try to capture this um, conversation in a, in a draft sort of recommendation piece for you all to, to review and, and build on. Just to, uh, kind of in closing, I, I think there's been too much heat and not enough light on, on what the options and the possibilities are for the Northwest Corridor. Lynn. Yeah, just, uh, <laughs> um, just one more thing that, uh, you know, I agree with, with um, everything Elise said. I think it's going to be a conversation, but, you know, I think we're on the right track to come up with the, the um, facts at this point. Um, if Amtrak comes through, I mean, the, it's not, as somebody pointed out to me, it's not their request at this point. It's in the administration's proposal to give them $80 billion. Our lobbyist last night said that typically an annual, that annually we give them two billion. So it's a lot of money. Um, this, is a, this is a different moment in time that I think needs to be respected. And um, my message and, and I think the message from Eric Davidson, the other person that represents Boulder County is, you know, if, if people here in the Northwest Corridor want it and they do, um, this is the time to talk to our federal delegation and see if we can um, can make a difference there because Amtrak is is looking to open routes. Um, they would pay the costs, as I understand it, they would pay the capital costs and they declining, they pay the operating costs initially and that would decline over the, for after, over the first five years. So um, 
that's that's the message I would pass is is uh, you know if this has a shot in any time in the near future it's now let's get out there and lobby for it and uh, and then maybe we go back to where you are right and and um, move forward with the conversation once we've completed this study. So if they did make that offer, if they did say they'll pay that, does it still have to go to the voters to get approval? Uh, because the operating costs will be part of what they'll have to look at. So I, I would assume it's still something that's gonna wind up going to our enlightened Colorado voters. I don't know. I don't, don't know what, what they would be, in, in what sense, right? Well, if, if, if you've got to have the money to pay the operating costs, then is that going to just come out of the 0.4% oh. or is there some other source for that? Uh, I assume it would be a connection with front range passenger rail um, and not all on RTD. I, you know, there's a, there right. are a lot of details to be worked out for sure. Right. I'm certain of that. In fact, it wouldn't come from RTD. It would probably only a piece of it would, I think, right. if at all. But then you're you're still left with the question of whether you got to go. I, and I noticed in the legislation, transportation committee is working on the big bill that's been in our legislature. There is a region that has been established where they could go to for that uh, for that cost. And if that region, then ultimately it seems to me it's going to have to go to a vote in the region on that. Whereas there was BRT discussed in the original uh, Fast Tracks proposal, wasn't there? I thought the, I saw hey, that. Right, the, the Flatanger Flyer was, is part of Fast Tracks. That was a component of Fast Tracks. So I don't know if you have to go back to the voters if you're gonna just do more BRT. It's a good I question, Elise. You would have to go back to the voters if you decided you didn't want to, to do Northwest Rail at all. But I, I don't think you have to go back to the voters for BRT. I agree. Certainly not for NAMS. That's a, you know, that's in addition. Right. So. Okay. We'll wait till 2042 to go back to the voters. Then. That's, is that a problem? <laughs> All right. Um, hey, any Rick? further comments? Did someone? Yeah. Yes? Yeah, so I, I don't have a hand raising icon here on, uh, on <laughs> Zoom screen. Well, you're um, always welcome to participate. You know that. I know. Thank you very much. Um, I and thank you for all the work that you did, Rut. Uh, it's uh, considerable. Um, and BRT uh, is a great interim step, you know, on a path to rail. Uh, a question I have is the ridership opening day ridership numbers for uh, the North Northwest corridor uh, at something like 4,100 when uh, I'm looking at the uh, flat irons flyer uh, facts and figures and they have uh, annual ridership in 2019 at 3,366,000 passengers, which equates to about 9,000 passengers per day on average is, is, would not those riders or a high percentage of them, you know, transfer to rail if it became available at some point? Um, it's, it's a fairly significant number of passengers and I assume that some of them would, you know, I don't know if Flatiron Flyer is still gonna continue operating after the rail service got built, but I would imagine a number of those passengers would be moving over to light rail. The other question I have is, we talk about the Northwest Corridor and it goes from where it ends today to Longmont. Has there been any discussion about, you know, phasing it and just getting it to Boulder initially, uh, where a lot of the ridership, if not all the ridership from, uh, is, is being generated for the Flatiron Flyer. Uh, and I apologize if I'm setting this conversation backwards and everybody else understands all this stuff and I'm not from over there. And, and uh, it would help me understand where where things stand, if somebody could answer those questions for me. You know, I would say it's kind of hard to imagine that we'd want to uh, eliminate the Flatiron Flyer when it really has a pretty loyal 
a group of ridership and it's built out and, and the infrastructure's there and everything else. That's one of the things I struggle with in, in line B is we've already got this thing that's, that's working well. We just chopped its, its uh, service back to a, a fraction of what it was before. So there would be, if you tried to operate both of them, they would both be sucking ridership away from each other. Uh, and I think, I think you might have a little problem canceling Flatiron Flyer, Elise. I was just gonna say, you would absolutely not wanna cancel the Flatiron Flyer. It, while there is some overlap in ridership, they, they don't go the, exactly the same routes. There's a lot more um, stops on the Flatiron Flyer um, local version to communities along the way. Um, they have different destinations. Um, so it absolutely would not be getting rid of the Flatiron Flyer. As Ron pointed out, they're both pieces of the original fast tax proposal that voters approved in 2004. One of the most important things about the Northwest Rail is it would go through downtown Louisville and on to Longmont, um, which the Flatiron Flyer does not do. Right. Um, it stops in Boulder. So um, now if we added 119 BRT that provides some service to, to Longmont, but they're just, there are different, um, the different riderships, so. And, and, and the other, the other thing is that's where the, the uh, Colorado 7 and the US 287 would, right. would come into play in, in serving some of those communities and other BRTs. I also stop. just wanted to, to say that the NAMS um, study back in 2014 did look at segmenting the rail out in, in pieces. And it was mm -hmm. decided that wasn't the, the best route, uh, way to go. Um, some of the safety considerations to two track, I mean, you're gonna have to, it, it made sense to plan for the in, entire corridor. Peak mm -hmm. service rail, um, would operate on some a different set of efficiencies, but um, that it, that was all studied back in 2014. So right. we can dig that up and dust it off if you wanna look through that, Dan. It's still on the web. <laughs> I did look at some of that as well along the way. That's the thing about the web, no matter what you do, it's gonna be out there for a long time. Linda, you looked like you were poised to say something, Lynn. Uh, no, I, I'm, I'm good right now, although I see that Bill Van Meter turned his video on. He's our front range trail. Uh, yes, Bill, I'd love to have your, I'd love to have your input in this. Uh, Ron, can you get Bill answered, connected? I, I think I am. Can you hear me? Oh, good. Hi, Bill. Yeah. So um, I, I was just waiting for the conversation to progress um, and make make sure I wear it in, weighed in on some of the questions and assumptions um, that have been stated and, and I agree with them. So um, yes, the Flatiron Flyer BRT service is assumed to continue um, regardless of Northwest Rail. It as um, Elise pointed out, it's seen as serving different markets, some of the same markets, but also different markets. Um, and they were both included in the Fast Tracks plan, both Northwest Rail and the Flatiron Flyer service. And in fact, that goes to one of Dan's um, questions or points, and that is Flatiron Flyer service is generally faster from point A to point B than the rail. Um, particularly for the commutes to downtown and runs at a more frequent service. So that helps explain the, um, the relatively low ridership forecasts on Northwest Rail versus Flatiron Flyer. So the intent and commitment is to operate both of those services if and when we get the Northwest Rail completed and that explains some of the dynamic um, relationship on, in terms of ridership with a more frequent and faster service, Flatiron Flyer would retain a significant portion of its current and, and forecast future ridership even with Northwest Rail. But they are serving, as Elise pointed out, some different and new markets such as Longmont, which is a pretty significant market, East Boulder on Northwest Rail, Louisville. 
And so um, those trade-offs are also kind of depicted in the model. And then um, Elise did a good job of uh, describing the analyses from the Northwest Area Mobility or NAM study, um, where we did conclude that we could build the Northwest Rail Corridor in some logical segments for service. Um, the challenge is the first segment is extremely expensive and um, you'll have infrastructure commitments made if you're incrementally building the corridor. Um, that wouldn't be necessarily required if you're building the whole corridor at once. So there were some pros and cons to that concept, including the fact that you know, a maintenance facility, a new fleet, um, that first incremental cost to start a service, no matter what your increment is, is substantial. And so um, I just wanted to try to address some of those questions and discussion topics from um, my perspective and our past analyses. Well, it's really nice to have some, someone here who has all of this history, uh, Elise and, and yourself and, and others. Um, is it a mistake on my part to double those ridership estimates then in looking at the accounting on Northwest? Yeah, you know, um, th that's a question that presuming RTD moves ahead with our analysis um, that we discussed with the board last night and that Ron Papsdorf um, recapped at the start of this meeting. Um, we will revisit in detail. Um, the, the discussion and commitment with our board last night was that um, we would use the doc latest Dr. Cog model. We would look at the travel markets in support of that in um, some level of detail, including those that are not included in um, directly in the Dr. Cog model, such as um, North Front Range um, markets. Uh, Dr. Cog does include Southwest Weld and all of Boulder County, but not the rest of the North Front Range directly in their model. So we would be revisiting our ridership forecasts, certainly um, the desire and concern that I've, I've heard and um, uh, even a little bit uh, today and elsewhere regarding ridership forecasts is um, there, there, there's some doubt regarding um, RTD's current forecast and, and the validity. And so we wanna revisit those in partnership with um, COG and the local governments and get um, some confidence around them. Doubling them, in my personal opinion, is probably um, a little aggressive, um, but I think it's reasonable for making, um, for, you know, for giving a fair shake. And, and yeah. so I'll leave it at that for right now. Sure. And I, one, one other emphasis is that we really are in the accountability committee considering some alternatives of how we, how we drive ridership by trying to provide services to people that are trapped in that first last mile. And it's not just first last mile, it's well beyond a mile. You know, there are ways that we could reach out to some of those underserved communities uh, and drive ridership much more effectively than we have in the past. I mean, the goal here is how do you maximize ridership on your transit service? That seems pretty fundamental. And so we're gonna, we're gonna try to look at every option we can find to do that. It's a challenging problem, Bill, as you well know. <laughs> it's an even more challenging thing to predict. Any, uh, any further comments? Rod, Rod oh, this day. Yeah, Doug. Thank you very much. And Bill, thank you for your comments, sir. I agree with Rod. It's nice, <laughs> nice having your, your experience and, and everything because you've, you've seen it all through the years, Bill. There's no doubt about it. Um, listen, I, I, I also wanted to echo that I think this, the opportunity and the conversations that were held at the, at the RTD board last night really presents an opportunity for us to do some scenario work, right, in that corridor and look at ridership options. And, our tool set that we have now is so much superior than what we used, we had even five years ago, right? With regards to speed and capability and all that. So I think we're a lot more nimble than what we were in the past for sure. Um, but what I really wanted to point out in case you weren't aware, let's note in the chat, as well as Lynn has brought this up too, with regards to Amtrak, um, our board has given us some direction through our federal policy statement to, um, 
you know, we obviously support Amtrak expansion into the Front Range Corridor and uh, given us direction to support and pursue that when, um, you know, the, hopefully that 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 becomes a reality. So, so us as staff, as well as our lobby team, will uh, will be actively exploring options associated with. I just wanted to throw that out there. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, it's good to hear. Got to got to be pulling from all directions or pushing. All right. Any other comments? Okay. Uh, Elise. Um, I don't know if we were done with Northwest Rail. I did want to bring up an idea that surfaced on Monday in the governance subcommittee about whether or not the accountability committee would want to step out of its current timeline to write a letter um, and weigh in on the transportation funding legislation that will be introduced shortly. A big debate, and the reason I'm bringing this up on, on finance is because it's about funding. And a huge part of the conversation is, um, how do we meet our climate targets? How do we, you know, how do we, um, you know, repair our transportation system? How do we provide mobility? How to reduce emissions? There's a big role for transit to play in a lot of these solutions and some of the feedback from, uh, from various stakeholders, the environmental community, Metro mayors and others are that the multimodal components of the bill could be beefed up. And right now I don't see a sort of a direct connection between the funding generated there and RTD, but if we are going to reduce VMT um, by 10%, by 2030, as the state roadmap calls for, we are gonna have to put people on transit. And so I think this committee, as we look at RTD's finances and, and the context we're operating in, has an opportunity to weigh in in a, in a positive, proactive um, way. But we would have to do so, not in July, <laughs> um, but sometime in the next couple of weeks. And so I just wanted to raise that in the finance subcommittee context to see if there was any interest. I know Jackie Malay was particularly keen on it um, and myself and the operations sub, uh, governance subcommittee, but I wanted to bring it up here mm -hmm. to get reactions. Great, great topic. Um, yeah, I, you know, I, I can't speak for the whole committee, but uh, I, I do know the legislative window is very short at this point. You know, it's by the time you get much into June, it's over. So, you know, if I think Sina Dai is, they're looking at late May, the last of her, but I don't know where it will be. But the legislature will be over soon and that bill will probably already be out. It may also be that <clears throat> rather than saying, here's exactly what you need to do, it's that you need to give some flexibility in how these funds are spent. So that as, as we move forward with that funding that's coming out of Colorado, that we have the ability to, to do different things with it, especially with regard to multimodal and, and uh, you know, alternative. Multimodal is a big part of how you can address some of the first last mile issues too. But it's like if, when I, I was really impressed by the, um, called uh, bus to bike or ride to bike or whatever. The, the way that uh, the Flatiron Flyer integrated uh, cycling into their, into their plans for the transit. Mr. Chairman, um, yes. if I'm Doug, I, uh, so if, if there's anybody on the call that's not real, famil real familiar with the uh, state transportation funding proposal, um, Senator Faith Winter is going to be presenting to uh, the Dr. Cog board at our work session this afternoon at four o'clock. Um, that item is currently scheduled for around 4.30, but knowing uh, Senator Winter's ca uh, schedule, whenever she can get on is when she's going to be presenting. So um, if you'd like to listen in on that, um, all the login and agenda information is on our website. Just kind of FYI. Okay. But, but I, I guess from committee members who are on this call, could, I, could we see a show of hands if people are interested in 
the RTD Accountability Committee weighing in on this bill in favor of multimodal funding? Could we just sort of straw poll it to see? I know Rebecca, you probably are, are recused from that, but, but um, right. other folks? I see Dan's got a thumbs up. Kristen, do you have an opinion on that? I got a thumbs up from Julie. <laughs> I am not able to do something like that today. Okay. Because I, th I think if, if there was some agreement on that, maybe we would ask Dr. Cog's staff to, I'm happy to put pen to paper too, but um, Maybe. You know those issues so well, Elise. I know you're busy, but it would, you, you did such a great job on the, on the uh, RTD bill. Uh, it would be great if you could say, here is the sort of thing that we would, we would want to try to do on this. Okay. I suggest it hasn't been introduced yet, but um, sometime in the next week or two, we could yeah. um, get sending something up then. Okay. I'm happy to work with, with staff on that. It has to happen quickly because that, you know, it's about to get introduced. I know. Okay, Rivers thanks. The legislature. Yeah. Could the Dr. Cog staff uh, make sure that we all have Brett's presentation, please? Yeah, it didn't make it. It, it, it started about uh, 36 hours ago, so it didn't make it into the, into the board book. I'm happy to share it with uh, everyone. Thank you. Anyone interested in seeing it. The, the meat is in those seven pages, 2,500 words with the math and all that other stuff, which I recognize not everyone really wants to invest in reading. We'll get it out though, Kristen. Good. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, we have run over by three minutes, but I would, uh, unless anybody has further comments, I would like to adjourn our meeting. Anything else? Okay, meeting adjourned. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Everyone.